Matt told you earlier on. Um, he's given you a good overview about what we are about. We are uh, human computer interaction designers. So we tend to put people at the heart of all of our design and innovation choices. Um, so what I'm going to try and lead on from um, now is I'm going to give you a couple of sort of concrete examples of what happens if you do not um, consider the human in what you are doing. And then Simon is going to hopefully go over some of our methods about how we involve people in what we build and what we make, um, which will hopefully then lead in nicely to uh, Thomas tomorrow, um, who will be giving you some case studies about how we've used our methodology in practice. So first of all, I'd like to introduce you to this term, uh, human-centered artificial uh, intelligence. So, Human-centered AI is a sub-discipline of human-computer interaction, and it really seeks to sort of um, amplify, augment, but also enhance uh, human abilities while you are creating AI systems. So the core values of this are that humans plus AI are better than either one can be individually. So sometimes it's quite tempting. I mean, I guess the, the ability of AI to automate tasks often means that they can do it a lot better than people can, right? So it can be quite tempting for us to conclude that they actually understand what we're doing and understand what we're thinking. Um, However, they are not artificial minds. As Matt explained very clearly this morning, people will never be machines, okay? People are unique, uh, they make mistakes, and we really need to accept that, all right? So in the words of Don Norman, so Donald uh, Norman is a very famous designer in our field. He wrote a great book called The Design of Everyday Things. I would highly recommend that. He said, the problem with, most, with the designs of most engineers is that they are too logical. Uh, we have to accept human behavior the way it is, not the way we wish it would be. So, in this sense, we really need to consider that AI applications must reflect realistic conceptions of uh, what user needs are if they are to properly succeed. So, um, in this talk, I am, like I said, going to go through some real-world examples of what can happen if you do not consider the human um, in your designs, and then Simon is going to um, show you some methods that we have used. All right, so... Why involve humans at all? So even before the days of sort of modern uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, technologists were making the big mistake of not or ignoring the human um, in technology-driven design. So one of the really classic examples um, uh, and sort of well-told stories in this area is um, a well-used and quite dangerous system that really didn't account for the human in its design at all. So you may be familiar with the Therac 25 machine. So this is a machine used in the early 80s uh, for tumor uh, treatments, okay? So this is a, uh, a machine that was involved in at least six really major incidents between sort of 85 and 87, in which patients were really given a, a massive overdose of, of radiation. Um, so without going into too much technical detail, here is an, um, a schematic of the Therac uh, 25 unit. It's got a high energy linear um, accelerator uh, to create a beam of electrons that can destroy t tumors quite uh, specifically, but with minimal impact on the surrounding healthy tissue. So a patient sits in a room, isolated obviously, to make sure that the operator does not get radiation poisoning. So the operator sits outside, and there's various interlinked uh, safety features like intercoms and so on, so they can communicate. Now, this model um, was a new version, um, which was actually an amalgamation of two previous models, all right? Um, and they put them together in order to create this new and enhanced system, which the manufacturer claims is more compact, more capable, and as they use the term, easier to use. However, it was far more dependent on software, and less so on the human operator. So, again, this is a schematic of a part of the system. It has two modes. It has an X-ray version and an electron version. And it's very critical that these two pieces of hardware align exactly, okay? Um, so there's the target versus the beam former. They need to be in the right place at the right time, otherwise it's really bad news for the patient. So some early incidents occurred um, involving this machine, uh, which were initially blamed on a failing microswitch, right? So the manufacturer said there's no way that they could malfunction. But then um, things started to go wrong. Patients would feel things that were going uh, first jolt, tried to get up. Video links weren't functioning, something was going wrong there. Um, the treatment was canceled for the day. 
but the calibration checks seem perfectly normal. Uh, no malfunction according to the uh, manufacturer, but later it had found that the uh, patient had gotten 25,000 rads uh, over one square centimeter and they eventually died after um, five months. So there are lots of problems with the Therac 25 machine. Many of these are based on kind of engineering issues, right? So race conditions, lack of documentation. It's the beyond the scope of what I'm talking about here. But one major issue uh, that was only picked up because um, one radiotherapy technician was present uh, during two incidents um, of this uh, particular problem uh, noticed uh, the malfunction 54 error message. So one interface quirk of this design is that it allows cursor movements on the keypad during um, calibration, if you like. So if the user selected, say, x-ray mode, um, and the machine would begin setting up the machine for high-powered x-rays, however, this process takes eight minutes, or sorry, eight seconds to complete. So if the user switched to electron mode within these eight seconds, the turntable would not switch over to the correct position, leaving it in an unknown state but there was no feedback for the user to let them know this information. And this is the problem. So it's worth noting here that this bug would not, almost certainly not have been found if it had not been for the human operator that knew how the system behaved. The company tried for months to try and recreate this error, but they just couldn't because they didn't know what was going on because there was no feedback. Um, once they did discover the problem, the fix, if you like, was just to don't use the cursor keys. Obviously, eventually this was recalled. So careless design in this case, or no testing on humans, the human operator um, was just an afterthought. Giving them feedback was just an afterthought, and it resulted in the death of many people uh, with this machine. A more recent example that you might be familiar with, um, yeah, the recent-ish recent crashes of the <coughs> Boeing 737 MAX airplanes. So Lion Air in October 2008 and Ethiopian in March 2019. Two crashes within five months of each other causes and a complete grounding of the entire fleet of 737 MAX airplanes. <coughs> so if anybody, is anybody familiar with this? Is anybody familiar with what happened here? Good, okay. Well, I'm gonna go over it and explain it to you about why it's important to involve the human in this, okay? So the extensive report on both of these crashes looks at many factors listing you know, a series of events. I think there were nine things in total that contributed to these two crashes, and all of them together, a sequence of unfortunate events <coughs> caused them. But one of these, one of the major ones, is a sensor which was not properly tested, okay? So sure, sensors fail sometimes, right? That isn't the cause of the crash. This particular sensor uh, fed information into the plane's maneuvering characteristics augmentation system, so that's the MCAS uh, system, which is used to help prevent the plane from stalling. But a series of failings meant the pilots were fighting against the plane for control. So here's what went wrong. So the MCAS is a stability system which helps stop the plane from stalling. So it has sensors in the nose to measure the angle of the flight, which tells the stabilizers in the tail to correct itself if something's going wrong. So um, if we're at risk of a stall, so if, we, if the tail is sort of 10 degrees lower than the nose, it pushes the nose down to compensate for that um, and stops it from stalling. But if the reading is wrong, so say caused by a faulty sensor, then the MCAS may activate and push the nose down anyway. So when it thinks it's correcting the problem, what it's actually doing is pushing the plane to a nose dive. This is altogether a bad thing, okay? So pilots can temporarily turn the MCAS off and pull the plane back up. But, and here's the problem, the system restarts if false readings continue. So if the sensor is completely bust, but the crew didn't realize, it will continue to push the nose down um, even though it's already pointing down. This creates a big tug of war between the aircraft and its crew. Um, so in this case, the MCAS system activated to correct what it thought was a stall, pointing the nose down. And this can happen repeatedly, um, if in this case, because of a faulty sensor. But the pilots didn't know what was going on. They didn't have any feedback. They didn't know what was happening. Um, so they repeatedly tried to raise the plane's nose, pulling back, um, fighting the system. And at faster speeds, this requires more and more human strength. They couldn't figure out what was wrong or how to disable the system because they didn't know the system had restarted and they didn't, there was no indicator light to tell them that it had been re-engaged. Um, so it turns out after all of this, uh, the light to um, indicate sensor disagreement um, was an optional extra, uh, about 80,000 US dollars, and considered by Boeing at the time to be a non-critical um, addition to the airplane. So because of this, um, the pilots had no feedback, didn't know what was happening, and it crashed, killing all on board, and two separate incidents. 
So, I mean, initially after the first crash, they used the pilots as scapegoats. It's easier to blame people than believing that there's a problem with the system. But after the second one, they looked deeper and realized that the issue was. And yet another example of why involving humans is critical in all design processes. If we'd have known this beforehand, that they knew the system was on because of a, for a light it letting them know, they could easily have re-engaged it and there would have been no problem. So now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the term human in the loop. Does anybody know what that term means? Anybody? Heard of it before? Okay, good, good. So essentially this is an AI model that requires human interaction. So it goes hand in hand with human-centered AI uh, and it means that humans are involved in the training, uh, testing, tuning process um, of building a machine learning model. So there's many ways that humans can be involved in this. They can label training data, um, they can learn which features to recognize, they can verify the accuracy of a model, um, provide feedback to the model when it makes an error. But crucially, it involves the, it makes sure that humans are a part of the continuous feedback loop with the model. And it aims to achieve what neither a human nor a machine can achieve on its own. It's used a lot in kind of simulators and so on. It's also used quite a bit in industry. So Facebook have historically always used sort of human editors to make sure that news um, articles that are being put on their platform are, you know, uh, valid and not inappropriate. Um, so a couple of years ago, 2016, they actually eliminated, hum eliminated sorry, human editors um, who had created, curated trended news stories. Um, but what happened then was the algorithm completely, um, immediately promoted fake and vulgar stories on news feeds, prompting them to completely U-turn and bring them back in. Uh, more recently, so just November last year, they've chosen again to remove the human curators from their news articles to save money because it's quite expensive, people, people power. Um, but now they've kind of really stepped back from news feeds on their, sorry, like news articles on their feeds. They keep saying things like, it's unprofitable, it's shrinking part of our strategy rather than actually allowing people power to solve these ongoing issues of fake news and vulgar stories. Just another reminder of why humans are important in the AI process and why we shouldn't simply rely on AI on its own. In case you need some more examples of why to involve people in this kind of thing. So this is um, an AI camera operator deployed by Scottish soccer team Inverness. So during the pandemic when um, it stopped fans from attending uh, matches and so on, the club announced that it would live stream uh, all its games using an automatic camera system with an inbuilt AI ball te tracking technology to make sure people always get the best view of the shots. But I'm sure you might be able to tell where I'm going here. Um, the system completely uh, repeatedly confused the ball with the lineman. He's got a bald head, just kept on following the bald head of the lineman around, um, around the field. Um, and this was caused by, obviously, the visual similarities between the bald head and the soccer ball. Um, the, the angle didn't help as well, because he looks like he, the ball is on the pitch. But, um, and the ball itself was yellow. There's loads of things that went wrong here, but a human could have told you that straight away, right? It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have happened to them. But the computer carried on going. Does anybody reckon this, this one? Classic example, yeah. So this is from 2016 again. This is um, an AI Twitter chatbot. Her name is Tay, short for thinking about you. So it was, they were experimenting with kind of conversational understanding at the time, and it was supposed to chat with people, um, and the smarter, it should have got smarter the more it engaged with people, and you know, have a little bit more meaningful conversation with them. But of course, people are being people, um, started treating crude, racist, inappropriate remarks at Tay. And learning from that conversation, um, Tay began to use that kind of language herself. And in a couple of hours, she was quite offensive, vulgar, pro-Hitler Twitter account. They had to take it off pretty much straight away. AI, as you probably know, also has some quite serious bias issues if you're not involving people in its design. So um, I'm not sure if you remember this, but Amazon had been building software a few years back uh, to sort of automate the process of reviewing job applicants' uh, resumes. Uh, with the intention of finding what they call the top five talents since 2014. This was a while ago. But it wasn't until over a year later that uh, the uh, machine learning specialist at Amazon realized that their recruiting tool um, was hiring for, that was hiring for technical roles, like things like software developers and so on, um, was definitely not gender neutral. It turns out that they trained their learning machine, um, learning algorithms on um, resumes that had been submitted to their company over a 10-year period. Now, 
think about who applies for software engineering jobs, at least in my, uh, um, my country, it's mostly um, white men that are quite interested in these roles. Um, so the algorithm learned this pattern and decided that women uh, were not good suiting, not well suited to technical roles. So uh, it's inherently um, gender bias. Here's another example, a beauty contest uh, that was meant to be judged on aspects such as you know, facial symmetry, gender, nice skin tone. Didn't go quite so well when we've got the judges here who are uh, robots or machine learning algorithms. They selected only winners that had white skin. Um, so beauty.ai was a tool created um, to see what beauty looked like from the perspective of artificial intelligence. Uh, turns out it really didn't favor women with dark skin. So apparently 6,000 odd people from countries around the world submitted their photos and the 44 winners that were announced, only one of them had dark skin. So again, a human could have told you that, but AI, no. Um, here's another bad example, a New Zealand man, Asian descent, he had his passport photo rejected where facial, facial recognition software keeps on telling him that he's got his eyes closed. Um, again, a human could have told you this straight away but uh, he could not get his passport application through. Now, there are lots of guidelines for how to um, make sure that you adopt human-centered um, approaches to AI. Um, um, so Google, Apple all have their own um, guidelines for this. And you know, there's lots of literature out there as well. I would recommend this book, Human-Centered AI by Ben Schneiderman. Ben Schneiderman is the founder of um, our field, HGI, um, and he's written this book now, Human-Centered AI, which is a very good read if you are interested in um, bringing human-centered design to your work, and you should. And with that, I'm going to transfer to Simon, who's going to give you a bit more context about some of the things that we do on some methods.